Greek painted pottery. Pottery is the most pervasive and enduring artifact of ancient Greek civilization. Without pottery, essential elements of Greek society would be lost forever. Heinrich Schliemann, a pioneer of modern archaeology, never realized his goals in the search for Troy because he never understood the relationship between the pottery he found at Hisarlik and the pottery of the Mycenaeans. The Greeks used ceramic creations as the basic utensils of daily life. In turn, pottery itself was a significant commodity, and its development reflects the ebb and flow of the ancient Greek economy. It was also a significant expression of Greek art. Enterprising manufacturers, trying to penetrate wider markets, employed decoration to attract consumers of varying tastes, outlooks, and goals. As a result, pottery decoration was one of the forces in the evolution of Greek painting. The sides of pots were the canvases upon which Greek artists experimented in their development of shapes, color, and perspective. Following the lead of Greek sculptors, Greek potters perpetrated the ideals of form and order that were the basis of Greek classicism. At the beginning of Greek history, the simple designs on proto-geometric pottery of the 10th and 11th centuries BC indicated the subsistence lifestyle and simple tastes of the Greek rural peasant economy in the Dark Ages, which followed the disappearance of Bronze Age culture. As Greek society evolved, so did Greek pottery. Thus, by 750 BC, a clear change appeared in Greek aesthetics. Greek artists began probing for a medium which expressed their view of the world. Decoration had long been an aspect of the potter's art, and at first, pottery decoration served only to fill or adorn the sides of pots. In the fully developed geometric styles of the early 8th century, stacked bands of swirls, zigzags, and meanders had resembled the decorations of basket wear and this pottery probably fulfilled the same practical purposes. In an expanding market, however, geometric decorations were severely limited in their possibilities. Creativity and originality were restricted. Thus, meandering lines were replaced with repeated stencil-like representations of human or animal figures. The effect of repetitive animal stencils was still one of surface decoration without meaningful narration. Yet, in rearranging the boundaries of space, artists happened upon the discovery that vertical dividers broke up horizontal bands into distinctive panels, like windows in a solid wall, a compositional element that fit well onto the curving shoulders or long necks of Greek pots. These window-like spaces provided a view into the world, where a painter could illuminate any observer about the purpose of the vase or the fancies of the imagination. At first, highly patterned human and animal figures in silhouette filled individual panels with set scenes that were easily identified. Funerals and the heroic poses of battles and games are the most recognizable. They are reminiscent of the formulaic sequences used by Homer and the bards, to describe the battles and banquets and councils of the great heroes. The oral techniques and accounts of the Iliad and the Odyssey could have been a source of inspiration, but with these two-dimensional silhouettes, artists employed an inventory approach. They conceptualized images as the products of their constituent parts, with no understanding of techniques such as foreshortening to portray perspective. Artists simply placed different body parts next to one another. Heads, usually in profile, were circles with a central dot for the eye. They sat on full frontal outlines of a torso supported by the profile of two legs. Three-quarter views were not attempted. Animals, such as horses or teams of horses with multiple parts, became single bodies with rows of repeated elements, a generic collection. Scenes were not specific. However, 
While the Greek artists struggled with how to create a truly representational figure on a flat surface, one point emerges, the Greek fascination with the human form and the human story. In fact, by the end of the 7th century BC, Greek pottery painting avoided nature scenes. Greek art, like Greek society, sprang from its first clumsy phases as the result of a rediscovery. About 750 BC, propelled by dynamic societies in the eastern Mediterranean, the Greeks awakened to the world. In the waning years of the warlike Assyrian Empire, merchants and traders of the Syrian coast sought out new markets and new sources of raw materials. The Phoenicians, for example, probed Aegean sea coasts, explored the western Mediterranean and founded colonies in Sicily and along the coast of North Africa. Among the Greeks, the older cities of western Asia Minor became the transmitters of culture from other Asian empires, like the Lydian kingdom of the infamous Midas with the Golden Touch. Legend credits these people with the invention of coinage. Corinthian potters were among the first to develop a commercial ware to exploit these new markets. From her position on the Isthmus of Corinth, Corinth was ideally suited to act as a depot for metals, luxury goods, agricultural products, and people moving both east and west. The clay of the Corinthiad had a delicate constitution, not suitable for large pots, but it served well as the containers for such things as cosmetic oils or powders. As a result, proto-Corinthian pottery is small, and its decoration recalls the tastes of non-Greek, especially Asian, buyers. The old geometric technique of stenciling rows of figures in narrow bands encircling the pot worked well on the small Corinthian vases. To appeal to Asian tastes, the frequent use of floral designs and mythological figures like griffins or beasts such as lions were prominent. Figure work was still essentially in outline, but Corinthian painters began to experiment with colors, white, yellow, purple, and they explored the technique of scratching lines into figures to outline features and create detail. At the same time, creative potters set a precedent by experimenting with smaller pottery of different shapes. These shaped vases, produced on a limited scale in every workshop, were especially prominent in Corinth and in the Ionian shops of Asia Minor. Small and formed into the shapes of animals or body parts, such works were the containers of specifically feminine products. The significance of these early years of renewed contact between Greeks and the Mediterranean world goes well beyond changes in artistic techniques and design. It initiated an era of development and growth from 750 to 500 BC, known as the Greek Archaic Age. Expanding markets and increased profits fostered population growth. There was a general consolidation of scattered agricultural enclaves into towns and cities, accompanied by the development of laws and governments as needed to ensure order. But Greece was a land of limited resources, which could not support unlimited numbers of people. The poet Hesiod, upset about the loss of the family farm to his older brother Perses, writes about the personal side of the change. O oh, Percy's store this in your heart. Do not let wicked strife persuade you, skipping work to gape at politicians, and give ear to all the quarrels of the marketplace. He has no time for courts and public life who has not stored up one full year's supply of corn, Demeter's gift, got from the earth. When you have grain piled high, you may dispute and fight about the goods of other men. A farmer by trade, Hesiod was forced to look for another means of livelihood. 
Faced with similar prospects, large numbers of young Greek men and women sought their fortunes in other places, and thus began a period of emigration and colonization. From 750 to 600 B.C., Greek settlers took the Greek language, Greek institutions, and Greek culture to the west, to Sicily and southern Italy, to the east, to as far as Egypt, and to the northeast, to the northern shore of the Black Sea. Early on, Athenian potters energetically tried to compete with Corinthian dominance of overseas markets. Blessed with an abundant source of more durable clay, the Athenians flooded the market with larger pieces of pottery useful for storing or shipping consumables like wine or food grains. Size and shape were the attractions of Athenian pottery because the Athenians were unable to surpass the quality of Corinthian decoration. The best Athenian figures were simple adaptations of geometric silhouette forms. Changes were minor with the occasional use of painted outline figures, detailed with painted lines. And yet, in the struggle to compete, creativity appeared. Athenian figures were much larger. They were adapted to the shape of the overall vase, releasing scenes and images from the restrictions of vase encircling bands or confined panels. For example, this neck amphora is a typical Athenian piece. It has large, imposing figures of humans, animals, and gorgons, energetically posed. Some figures are in silhouette, while others are drawn in outline, all with the unnatural proportions typical of geometric styles. Attic vases represent the overall state of Greek art. The large figures reflect the same grandeur in size and concept that appears in the evolving kouros and kore statues that are the main subjects of the developing Greek styles of human figure sculpture. Greek sculptors had gained technical training and a certain inspiration from Egyptian statuary, sliding easily into a mindset that adopted Egyptian magnificence and style as a fitting way to represent the gods and heroes of Greek mythology. Preserved in elaborate oral works, Greek mythology with its larger-than-life characters was the main source of artistic inspiration. Correspondingly, the scenes painted on pottery in the first half of the 7th century focused on the violent events that formed the basis of many oral traditions, chief among them the works of Homer. Greek art in the Archaic Age demonstrated a deep ambivalence toward violent circumstances. On the one hand, violence represented the toil, struggle, and uncertainty of life. The frequent scenes of battle with the horrible Gorgons, the Greek icon of life's woes, illustrate this. The same apprehension is evident in the work of Hesiod. He felt threatened by the order imposed upon the common man, by the heavy-handed force of stronger masters. Clutched in the hawk's claws, a speckled nightingale she, pierced by those hooked claws, cried, Pity me! Only a fool will match himself against a stronger party, for he'll only lose, and he disgraced as well as beaten. Thus spoke the swift-flying hawk, the long-winged bird. On the other hand, as Homer often describes, it was in the heat and chaos of battle that one actually proved personal worth and obtained glory. Tall Hector of the Shining Helm answered her, I would feel cheap shame before the Trojans and the Trojan women with trailing garments, if like a coward I were to shrink aside from the fighting, and the spirit will not let me, since I have learned to be valiant and to fight always among the foremost ranks of the Trojans, winning for my own self great glory, and for my father. By the middle of the 7th century B.C., 
The Greeks idealized an unemotional, direct, and severe view of the world. Order and control eased the uncertainties of existence. This was evident in the somber expressions common in Greek statuary. It is also reflected in the new style of pottery decoration that took over the market around 650 B.C., Athenian black figure. The black figure technique consisted of dark paint or, as with Athenian ware, a black glaze applied to the buff clay. Figures appear in silhouette, and a tail was added by lines scratched into the glaze by a sharpened engraving tool. Separate colors were laid over the blackened silhouette, white for the flesh of women and red for men's beards. Unfortunately, color often did not wear well and has since disappeared from many pieces. Essentially, black figure decoration is an outgrowth of Proto-Corinthian styles, and over time it retained a great deal of similarity to the Proto-Corinthian. This is quite evident on a very famous early 6th century work, the Francois vase. This Athenian volute crater was found in Etruria, the region north of Rome, the Mediterranean's largest customer of Athenian products in the second quarter of the 6th century B.C. Covered with dozens of small characters, the Francois vase retains the encircling bands which characterized Corinthian pottery. Figures are also in miniature, demonstrating the survival of the Corinthian miniaturist technique, but also confirming the suitability of black figure in recreating small, precise, incised forms. Here the bands of small forms fill the broad surface of a large vase with an anthology of generic experiences that are representative of the life of Achilles only in their combination. Such small, simple figures when standing alone have no identity, and so the potter identified characters with printed labels. Eventually, as potters defined the elements of their craft and stylized the elements of their subjects, individual characters became known by fixed attributes like the owl insignia on Athena's armor, or an easily recognized mythological scene like Heracles killing the Stymphalian birds. In time, the black figure style came to dominate pottery decoration because it was simply more suitable to the decoration of ceramics than other techniques. Athenian potters realized that the broad areas of black were impressive in the manner in which they emphasized curved surfaces and the shapes of pots. Moreover, blackened figures had a greater fullness, with more powerful curves and a more precise line than previous geometric styles. Incision, the lines scratched on the vase surface, added the minute, particular details that were truer to the elements of observation. Note the natural appearance of the human hand in this fragment of the scene where Achilles accepts the armor crafted by Hephaestus to replace that lost by Patroclus. But for all the detail, there is simplicity and gravity in the forms of blackened figure decoration, something that was lacking in geometric painting. It was all a part of a growing appreciation of the human experience and of the heroic as a part of life. By using black figure, painters were able to choose and express a sense of the moment, the individuality and uniqueness of the particular in a story or event. In this black figure scene from the myth of Castor and Polydeuces, the charming and very natural greeting of the dog for the returning Polydeuces takes its place in the tale of a hero, and the commonplace is now of monumental significance. That same sense is evident in the way in which the painter Exequius represents the simple break from the battle taken by Ajax and Achilles as they play a relaxed board game. More and more, as the 7th century ended and the 6th century began, artists sought out the moment of life, and as they incorporated the life around them into the stories of heroes, they created one of the greatest sources of information about the day-to-day -day activities and practices of the ancient Greeks. This was true in sculpture as well as pottery.
A great deal of Greek pottery served as decorated utensils. For example, part of the paraphernalia of male life was the kylix, the large two-handled cup found among the table setting of the symposium. Symposia were the formal dinner parties which served as the basis of the social life among men. Spartan society, for example, was notorious for its male dominance, and kylix-shaped cups are one of the few remnants of Spartan art. Typically, the outside of the kylix offered no more than a narrow band running around the piece, the kind of surface ideally suited to the design and detail of the black figure miniature. On the other hand, the interior of the kylix presented a round, flat surface, the perfect area for small scenes that could be confined within a narrow border, or as in many Athenian cups, a small tondo between fine concentric circles with wider borders often filled in with colored design. The success of the black figure technique was due in part to the energy of the unique political phenomenon which the Greeks called tyranny. The Greek tyrants, whose methods of control resembled the political patronage machines of 19th century American political bosses, allied themselves with the growing merchant class and seized control by suppressing the clans that divided Greek society. Under such men as Sipsilus of Corinth, Polycrates of Samos, and Pisistratus of Athens, individual Greek cities organized and unified their population, creating systems of law to foster popular-styled governments for internal security, and the operation of administrations that made overseas expansion and commerce profitable. The tyrants laid the foundations of the Greek polis system, but their success was their undoing. The larger Greek cities became regional centers, too large for the centralized one-man rule of the tyrants, and the huge effort needed to beat back the Persian invasions that opened the 5th century made tyrants irrelevant. As a result, government replaced personality as the ruling principle. In Athens, the period between the death of Pisistratus in 528 B.C. and the Persian defeat in 479 B.C. is marked artistically by the success of red figure decoration, overtaking but not eliminating the older black figure styles. Red figure reverses the black figure technique. Retaining the essential principle of the silhouette, the red figures are left in the natural color of the clay, while the background is painted over with a shiny black paint. This allowed the painter the freedom to handle his subject like an outline drawing. Figures were first scratched in outline on the wet clay. Next, the outline was painted and detail was drawn with lines of dark fluid that could vary in width and length as applied by either brush or a pen. Finally, the background was painted. Red and black colors came out in the firing process through the introduction and withdrawal of oxygen and smoke into the kiln. With the creation of the red figure style, potters did not stop using black figure, but early on red figure artists distinguished themselves by concentrating on the decoration of certain vase shapes, such as the neck amphora, which was soon modified into the hydria shape. The use of decorative motifs also changed. The large areas of black surface were an elegant decoration in themselves, and so ornamental motifs and designs became accents relegated to component parts of the vase, such as handles, neck, and base. Or they could serve as the borders and frames for figured scenes. No longer did ornaments fill the whole surface of the pot.
Red figure development coincided with the beginnings of classical conceptions of order and the perfect form. Greek sculptors were the first to develop the technique of representing the ideal human figure, and it took painting styles nearly a generation to catch up. The vase painter had to move away from the severe formalism of black figure with its incised details. This evolution of the sense of classical form and order reflects the essence of the Greek Archaic Age. The reestablishment of contact with the world, the changing social order, evolving democratic institutions, and the trauma of the Persian Wars reinforced the Greek sense of the uncertainty of life. Therefore, to understand the universe and to reproduce realistic images of its elements, Greek artists, like the great philosophers, embarked on the search for the basic elements of existence. The compelling force was the need for order. In the Greek mind, order brought understanding and stability. As a result, the goal of artists was to reproduce that idealized, ordered image that best expressed the stability of being. Throughout Greek art and literature, there is an explicit tension between the Greek fear of the changeability and uncertainty of life and the desire to discover and master a basic order to mitigate the effects of change. In red figure pottery, the search for the ideal is first demonstrated in the concern for the three-dimensionality of the human form. While earlier work had shown bodies either fully frontal or in profile, often a combined frontal upper body and profile legs, the new style paid much closer attention to the actual line of the human shape. In red figure, there is often an attempt to depict the twist of the body by the utilization of the three-quarter view. As in this piece, the body moves up from a near profile of the buttocks to shoulders, just short of a full back view. So, while still somewhat schematic, body lines did correspond to something in nature. Red figure painters enhanced their ability to represent a truer visual image as they accelerated the shift in subject from the heroic and mythological to the more everyday aspects of Greek life. In most phases of Greek thought and art, the late 6th and early 5th centuries BC displayed an even more intense interest in things human, in how the human species acted in and was acted upon by the elements of existence. Visual artists strove for the perfect bodily image, and therefore painters and sculptors paid increasing attention to the use of the human body as the main element of their work. For example, the actions and duties of athletes exercising in the palestra or the stadium are common subjects on red figure pottery. Athletics are the operation of the human machine, and athletics at a high level, such as the Olympic Games, provided ordered displays of the highest ideals of human form and function. Thus, when viewed as an expression of perfection and achievement, it is not surprising that Greek artists depicted athletes in the nude, the ideal human form. Of course, in Greek society, women did not participate in idealized activities such as public athletics. Nevertheless, attempts to depict the female form also had a distinct effect upon Greek artistic development, and the artistic images of women tell us a great deal about the place women occupied in Greek society. In many ways, the lives of women were the embodiment of daily life, so women were commonly represented performing routine chores. Popular as well, especially on wine vessels preferred by men, were scenes of prostitutes and female companions, the hetairai. In Greek society, there was a tremendous gulf between the lives of men and the lives of women and the social gap between men and women is obvious in Greek painting. The drawings of women's bodies did not exhibit anatomy in the same way as the depictions of men. Female bodies were frequently less detailed, lacking the refinements of muscular detail that were drawn on male figures in lines of thin glaze. 
Instead, artists more often experimented with the decorations of female figures, elaborating upon the minutia of hairdos or the folds and adornments of female clothing, and thereby improved their knowledge of shape and color. For example, late in the evolution of the red figure style, Clothed figures often had the body drawn through the garment's material. And yet, there is in such pictures a sensitivity to the feel and shape of clothing hanging from the shoulders, draped over extended limbs, or hugging the curves of the body. In the first century A.D., the Roman polymath Pliny the Elder remarked on the soft appearance given to painted drapery and colorful female headdresses. In such things, Pliny caught a glimpse of the naturalness of life that marked the end of the stiff formalism of archaic art. Red figure pottery never lost entirely its formulaic and rigid appearance, which was a natural result of the technique and its medium. The red figure silhouette fit well onto the small, curved surfaces of Greek pottery. Placed against the traditional shiny black background, figures were essentially two-dimensional in nature, so that they retained something of that reverence and seriousness that was an essential part of the archaic period. And yet red figure painters were able to develop better methods to represent space. In the early 5th century, in the rebuilding that followed the Persian invasions, Greek wall painters experimented with new depictions of space. In imitation, Greek pottery painters moved their figures off the baseline that had been the foundation of pottery scenes. Instead, figures stand at various heights along wavy lines, drawn across the various quadrants of the scene as if standing on the contours of uneven ground, or partial figures are hidden behind undulations in the landscape, or behind other figures with a new relationship between figures and background, heightening the illusion of space. Figures at different levels were shortened to fit into the changed contours, changing the relationships between figures sensitizing painters to the nature of pictorial space. By the fourth century, such practices led to the development and use of perspective in Greek painting. The changing nature of space, like the emphasis on the happenings of every day and the experimentation with decoration, enhanced the individualistic nature of painted figures. Greek painters, considering the distinctiveness of their artistic product, expressed the growing concern with the essence and importance of the human individual. Vase painters could still recognize individuality by including the names of characters in their works. Gone, however, are the formulaic arrangement of figures and the repetition of set scenes. In their place are expressive figures and distinctively crafted scenes. Economically, Greek pottery continued to be a significant element of Greek life well into the 4th century. The techniques and styles of pottery painting lost their importance to the evolution of Greek art by the third quarter of the 5th century BC. Red figure decoration, for example, had been ideally suited to the needs and expressions of the archaic age. Its inherent formalism fit the mood of the times. But red figures isolated against the black, unchanging background did not fit the new narrative modes and purposes of Greek art. The last real attempts to adapt pottery decoration to a narrative format were the white ground styles that became popular in the middle of the 5th century. The white ground technique worked against a whitened background. And, simply put, it presented something like a blank canvas against which the painter could work. Unfortunately, the silhouette technique seems to have been so deeply embedded in the painter's minds 
that artists were never able to put it behind, and white ground pottery became but a pale reflection of the red figure silhouette styles. It was especially prominent on the lycothos shape, a ritual vessel used in funeral rituals and in smaller sizes serving as oil jars on ladies' vanities. As with previous pottery types, white ground pottery was produced in large quantities for a mass market. As such, it lost the creative energy that had characterized earlier painting styles. The real impetus for Greek pottery decoration had come from the developing attitudes and energies of the Archaic Age. In its formative stage, the Greek identity was searching for its place in the cosmos. Trade and emigration characterized the Greek position. Life and identity were still simple and uncertain, and black figure and red figure painting styles, with their basic silhouettes, reflected those perceptions. By the 5th century, as Greek civilization defined itself, Greek identity became too complex to catch in an outline. And so, the creative energies of Greek painters sought other mechanisms, in architecture and mural painting, to express their visions of life and reality.